So welcome to this webinar. My name is Natalie. I work in the community legal education team at Legal Aid New South Wales, and we run a Law for Community Workers program of webinars and, and podcasts. And today we are very fortunate to be joined by the team from No More. We've got Prue, Maura and Sophia, and they will introduce themselves a bit later on. And they're going to be talking about the National Redress Scheme for people who have experienced institutional child sexual abuse. Also, before I hand over to our presenters, we're just going to do a very quick poll to find out what you already know about the National Redress Scheme and no more. So you can see on your screen in front of you, you can choose more than one option. Please select what, which of these you have heard of. So have you heard of the National Redress Scheme? Have you heard of No More Legal Service? Have you heard of them but you want to find out more or is it all new to you? So that would be really helpful to find out what people know already. So I'm just going to give you another second. Thank you everyone. I'm going to close that now and share the results. So um, Prue, Maura and Sophia, can you see that there? So how many so 66% yes. of people have heard of the, the National Redress Scheme, only 56% have heard of No More, so hopefully 100% of people will after this session. And um, it, for 16%, this is all new to them. So I think that's great. Everyone seems to be in the right place today. So thank you very much. And I'm going to hand over now to Prue. Thanks, Prue. Thanks, Natalie. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the different lands on which we are meeting today and pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be present in the webinar today. No More is funded by the Australian Government as represented by the Attorney General's Department and the Department of Social Services. The design images of the slides on today's PowerPoint have been inspired by original artwork by Dean Bell. Dean is the team leader of our Aboriginal engagement team and shows connection, no more's connection to towns, cities, missions and settlements within Australia. Today, we will be briefly looking at no more legal service and the National Redress Scheme, providing some background information on both, but we really want to focus on the emerging issues that we've seen over the last two years as the scheme has begun operating. There is importantly a two year review that's coming up and I would really strongly encourage people who've got experience with working with survivors of child sexual abuse that you have a look at participating in that review and we can help you with that. Um, and finally we talk about how No More can help you generally through either the Redress Support Service project which I'm heading up or through No More's legal service. I'm really pleased today to have Sophia and Maura with me to present this PowerPoint presentation. So No More Legal Service, um, we were previously funded to advise people in relation to the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. This was the first time in Australian legal history that a legal service was buddied up with a Royal Commission. We were for a limited legal service, so we were meant to come to an end with the end of the Royal Commission. That didn't happen, and in February 2018, we received additional funding to work with people who were looking at their compensation and redress options following the Royal Commission. We have offices in Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne and Perth. We are a free, independent and multidisciplinary service and importantly, there is no means test to access um, any advice or uh, support or service with the No More Legal Service. Our multidisciplinary model comprises lawyers, social workers and counsellors, Aboriginal engagement team members and financial counsellors. The Royal Commission estimated that there were about 60,000 people within Australia who'd been as sexually abused as children in Australian institutions. Given what we are now finding, we suspect that that figure may well be an underestimation of the number of people. For many people, making an application through the redress scheme will be the right thing to do. But importantly, 
they will, when they accept that offer, be giving up significant legal rights in relation to civil litigation against the institution. And it's really important that before they people sign up for the accepting that redress, that they receive legal advice as to what other options may well be available to them. No more lawyers can provide that legal advice. We can also prepare and submit complex redress applications. And for the support services who are working with clients to do applications, we can help you as well. Giving you a background of the no more clients at present, so this is up to the 30th of June, 24% of our clients are priority clients. That means that they, those clients have an estimated life expectancy of 12 to 24 months. And it's really important that we work as quickly as possible to lodge their applications if that's what they want. 27% of our clients identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients. And that is really and truly as a result of the very hard work of our Aboriginal engagement team members. It is important for our Aboriginal clients that they trust the organisation that they're coming to, and it is entirely due to the hard work of our team, our Aboriginal engagement team, that that figure is so high. 38% of our clients identify as female and 61% as male. Again, importantly, 75% of our clients are over 46, with the bulk being between that 46 to 65 age group. Up to the 30th of June this year, we've taken 32,883 calls, and that's translated into 6,531 clients completing intake. You'll see the figure there of 70% of our clients now are new. They have not been to the Royal Commission, and more likely than not, have not contacted no more. So that is why we are drawing the conclusion that that 60,000 people or estimate estimate of the Royal Commission may well be conservative. No more is a trauma-informed practice, which means that we operate within these principles of safety, respect, trustworthiness, collaboration and choice. Being trauma-informed means being ready, willing and able to work with survivors in a way that is not re-traumatising for that person and that recognises that trauma impacts can get in the way of survivors receiving an adequate or even a just service. It is really important that survivors are believed above all else. When we create an environment that's emotionally, physically, psychologically and culturally safe, we'll see ourselves as workers being non-judgmental and accepting that that person is a deserving person and deserving of the trust and the advice that we can provide. When we foster opportunities for choice, collaboration and connection, we will really see ourselves in conversations with people that are authentic. We can help people explore what will work for them and what won't. Having said all that, it is really easier said than done. Um, and it really takes a conscious effort to be totally focused on those principles of a trauma-informed practice. To do that, we set up strategies to help us understand the trauma and violence that impacts on people's lives and behaviours. We are constantly having training on how to do this and how to constantly do this in a way that we remain in a safe place as well as our clients remain in a safe place. It is really important that through uh, implementing these principles of a trauma-informed practice that we manage the expectations of our clients. I can't estimate how, underestimate how important it is for us to be absolutely authentic with our clients and not to over-promise. Um, over our clients have had this, have constantly had expectations knocked out of them. They've really experienced hardship beyond what most of us can understand. We only do further damage if we overcook the egg, basically. That if we hold out things that may not happen, we are just setting them up for, again, another setback. 
it's really important to manage those expectations. It's also important that the leadership within the organisation, and Noble tries its hardest to do this, establishes and fosters a culture of self-care and a total understanding of the risk of vicarious trauma. Moving on to the National Redress Scheme, just to give you again a brief overview. I'm sure you all are aware that this scheme will last for 10 years and it will conclude on the 30th of June 2028, with the last applications being lodged on the 30, before the 30th of June 2027. The claims process is paper driven. The application itself is 30 pages and it's divided into three parts. Part one deals with the personal information. Part two is the sexual abuse section, and it is incredibly important that the detail be provided in part two. Part three details the impact of the abuse. What is shared with the institution from part one is the name and the date of the birth, the date of birth of the person. All of part two, so all of the sexual abuse detail will be shared with the institution. That's to enable them to find the, the records that relate to the client and to the that institutional responsibility for the care of that person. Part three will only be shared with the institution with your client's consent. There will be a case manager appointed within the redress scheme and that case manager will be the person responsible for your client. They will take the calls from your client and from you up to the point that the matter is referred to the independent decision maker. At that point, it goes to another team member within the scheme. The standard of proof or what evidence is required is lower than for civil proceedings and for criminal proceedings. It's reasonable likelihood. And again, it's important to emphasize that this is not a situation where you have to cross every T and dot every I. You don't have to have corroborative evidence for every statement you make. The application should stand by itself. So any additional information um, needs to be consistent. And if it's not consistent, our advice would be not to include it. What is offered there are three parts of the redress scheme or the redress offer, a payment up to 150,000. It's important to realise this is not a compensation payment. It's not going to make any allowance for pain and suffering or for economic loss or for loss of income. It is an acknowledgement of what occurred. There is access to counselling or psychological support. And the third component of the redress offer is a direct personal response or an apology. And that is totally if the client wants that. Can I encourage you when you're supporting a client and they receive that redress offer to tick all of the boxes? We are finding that many of our clients initially say, no, I don't want an apology. I never want to see them again. And so they just say tick one and two, I'll have the payment and I'll have access to counselling, but you can forget the last one. We are getting a number of clients coming back a week later, six weeks later and saying, I've been thinking about it. I really want them to apologise. Unfortunately, that acceptance document is a legal document. You cannot come back and change it. So just to make sure that all bases are covered, we are strongly encouraging people to tick all of the boxes. Whether the client decides to accept an apology, it's up to them. They will not be approached by the institution if they've ticked that box. Prue, just, can I just interrupt for a second? I just got one announcement that the, the slides are in a handout that's attached to the webinar. So if you wanted to look at a copy of the slides, you can download that yourselves from the panel. And we've just got a question. I guess at this time, people are interested in how services have changed because of COVID-19. So if you can talk just very briefly about, I guess, no more services and also the National Redress Scheme, like the case management model, has anything changed uh, since COVID? Thanks, Natalie. Um, my understanding is initially the uh, National Redress Scheme, all of the workers went to work from home, but they are now back in Canberra. 
Um, so there are two main hubs for the scheme, one in Canberra and one in Melbourne. The Melbourne one is closed. Uh, that's my understanding, it's not deemed to be an uh, essential service. Um, the one in Canberra is functioning. There is no change to the case, uh, case coordination model that they're using. There may be some delay in someone phoning you back if they are working from home um, and they're working certain hours. But my understanding is that, that there's been no impact now on the way that the National Redress Scheme is working. In relation to no more, we have critical teams working in all of our offices bar Melbourne, which we've now shut. Um, but that doesn't alter the fact that we are all available to provide advice. In relation to the redress support service, which is the um, capacity building project I'm leading, we're uh, finding that we're doing a lot of training by Zoom and by Teams, and it really has had no impact apart from the fact that we can't come out and do face-to-face -face training at this stage. Though so we're looking at doing it in Western Australia and in Tasmania, um, where we have solicitors and they can travel within those borders, but it's just at this stage too difficult for us to do it in the other states and territories. So I'm hoping that that has answered those questions. Um, just this slide Sorry, shows- Sorry, we've got more questions, but we will be coming to those at the end. I'll let you keep going. So thanks, everyone. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Natalie. Um, as of the 26th of June, this is the data from the National Redress Scheme. So they've um, received 7,261 applications, 3,382 decisions have been made, and that's totaled um, a payment of $220.9 million, with the average payment of $82,000. That's an interesting average because the Royal Commission itself in its report estimated the average payment under a redress scheme capped at 200,000, not at the current cap of 150,000. The average payment they estimated would have been 65,000. Now I'm going to then um, ask Sophia to talk about the emerging issues in relation to the first stage, which is the pre-application stage of the redress scheme. Thanks, Sophie. Thanks, Prue. Um, so prior to assisting a client to make an application to the National Redress Scheme, it's really important that we check that the client is actually eligible for redress. So as Prue has um, outlined, we really need to be very careful to manage our client's expectations from the outset. Um, so to be eligible, the client needs to have experienced child sexual abuse in an institutional context when they were under 18. So I'll give you a brief overview of what um, the eligibility criteria are. Now, many people have experienced terrible physical and emotional abuse in institutions, but there has to have been sexual abuse to be eligible for the National Redress Scheme. Um, the non-sexual abuse is certainly relevant, um, but there needs to have been sexual abuse to meet that initial eligibility criteria. There must have, um, the person must have experienced sexual abuse when they're a child, so that obviously means when they were um, under 18. The abuse needs to have happened in an institutional context. Um, and so what we need to show is that an institution was responsible for bringing the person into contact with their abuser. Now, sometimes that's very obvious. Um, for example, someone was abused by a teacher at a school uh, or a scout leader in a scouts club. Where it becomes trickier is in, for example, cases where um, the abuse occurred by a family member. Um, this type of abuse would generally not be covered. Um, however, there are many situations where um, there is actually some form of institutional involvement or oversight at the time that the abuse occurred within the family. So um, it's not necessarily clear cut and no more is um, certainly available to advise on eligibility issues um, as they come up. So um, encourage people to get in touch with us. The abuse needs to have um, occurred before the 1st of July 2018, which is, um, as Prue said, the date that the scheme started. The person needs to have been born before the 30th of June 2010 
Uh, now that's because the scheme closes in June 2028 and for a person to accept an offer of redress they have to be 18 years old. So if we work backwards from there that means that they must have been born before the 30th of June 2010. The person must be an Australian citizen or permanent resident at the time when they apply to the National Redress Scheme. Now this um, creates uh, a lot of difficulty for someone, for example, who has been uh, in immigration detention when the sexual abuse occurred um, and for former child migrants. Uh, at No More we've been, um, well we have a, a number of former child migrant clients um, who have returned, for example, to the UK. Um, they've either not taken out Australian citizenship or they may have been permanent residents um, but they've given that up when they have returned to the UK. And so unfortunately, um, there is a cohort of former child migrants who are not eligible for the National Redress Scheme. Uh, the person can't have already received a court ordered payment. Now this is different to a situation where um, they may have started a court process, but ended up negotiating an out of court settlement. Uh, with the institution and there's no order made by a judge. So most people, uh, in most cases, um, people who have received a prior payment um, have done so through out of court negotiations rather than by um, a court ordered um, payment. Until recently, there haven't been many um, actual court ordered payments, um, but we are seeing more come through at the moment and there's certainly been um, a few that have occurred, um, particularly in, in Western Australia. Uh, the responsible institution has to have joined the scheme. Uh, the National Redress Scheme can only process applications where the institution responsible for the abuse has joined the scheme. If an institution hasn't joined, um, then the application will be placed on hold. And so that um, has caused issues, um, particularly in the last couple of years of the scheme running. Um, at the moment, the majority of relevant institutions have joined the scheme and there's just a small group um, of relevant institutions who um, are lagging there. The person can't currently be in jail um, if they want to apply for redress, uh, although there are some exceptions to this rule and um, I believe Prue will talk a bit more about that um, shortly. So these are some of the really important considerations that we need to be alert to when we're first talking with a client, um, like we've said, to really manage the expectations. Um, and if there are any doubts about eligibility, we really encourage people to phone no more um, to receive some advice, you know, rather than sort of embarking on the redress process and hoping for the best. Thanks, Maura. Okay, one of the other really important initial factors uh, that we assess is whether the client falls into a priority category uh, based on their age or poor health. So Prue mentioned this earlier. Um, priority clients are people with life limiting illnesses. So we're looking out for things like a life expectancy of um, 12 months or less, a stage four cancer diagnosis, organ failure, these types of things. Um, Priority clients are also people who are elderly, and elderly means um, born before 1944 for non-Indigenous people, or born before 1964 for Indigenous people. And the aim is that we submit their redress application as quickly as possible while the client is still alive. Um, if the application is submitted while the person is alive, then the redress decision can still be made after they pass away. Um, and a family member, or friend can't apply for redress on someone's behalf after the person has died. So it's really important that we lodge these applications as quickly as possible. Um, so I want to give you a, a short example of how we work with clients who fall into this priority uh, category at No More. Now my example is a client who lives in regional Tasmania. He's an Aboriginal man born in 1946. Um, so he's 74 years old and then falls into that priority client category based on his age. Um, thankfully, aside from his age, he's in relatively good health. He experienced uh, sexual abuse as a child in, a New, South, in New South Wales um, the, and a 
government department in New South Wales was responsible for his care at the time. Um, he contacted No More early this year to discuss his various legal options. Um, no More's intake officers who answer the phones picked up on his age priority and arranged for our lawyer to provide him with urgent legal advice about his options. Um, he also received um, support from our Aboriginal engagement team. During that time period, we were conducting outreach in Tasmania. So some of the contact that we had with this man was able to be face, face to face, which was really helpful um, given his age. After receiving his initial legal advice, uh, the man elected to make an application to the National Redress Scheme. Based on his age, he wanted a quicker and less involved process than some of the alternatives. Um, we worked quite intensively with the man and submitted his application to the National Redress Scheme in April this year. Um, we included a cover letter uh, for priority clients uh, with the application requesting that it's processed um, urgently based on um, our client's advanced age. The man also appointed No More as his assistance nominee for the redress application, which meant, meant that um, No More could liaise with the redress scheme to confirm the priority status of the application um, and to make sure that um, everything was going to be processed uh, as quickly as possible on uh, the redress scheme's end. So after submitting his uh, redress application, we helped the man to access um, some inexpensive options to obtain a will and to prepare a power of attorney, um, which is something that we'll discuss a bit more later on. Uh, the redress scheme acknowledged uh, our client's age priority and acted really quickly processing the man's application within three months, which is definitely one of the quickest examples um, that I'm aware of. Uh, the man was offered $95,000 uh, counselling and a direct personal response from the institution, uh, which he has just recently accepted. Um, now, the man uh, was really happy uh, to have some financial security at this stage of his life, and he's planning on spending some of the money travelling back to New South Wales uh, to reconnect with his country and family, um, which I think is really beautiful. Um, now, I'll admit that not all of our experience in working with um, this ageing cohort is so uplifting, um, but I thought this was a good example of the way in which we um, at No More and the Redress Scheme can respond um, to the needs of this priority group um, according to um, their age and health. Thanks, Maura. Okay, so as we've talked a bit about, um, many survivors are elderly um, and may pass away before a decision is made about their application, unfortunately. As long as the application has been lodged before they die, it can still be processed. Um, if the redress scheme decides to make a redress payment, mm -hmm. uh, then they'll look at who the survivor wanted the payment to go to. So one of the things that we will look at, um, sorry, that they will look at is the person's will, if they have one. Um, and what it says about where, uh, who they want their estate to go to. So it's a really good idea to check um, with your client um, about whether they have a will and if so, whether it's up to date. Um, if not, encourage them to make one. Uh, and there are some services that will do wills for little to no cost in each state or territory. Um, so this is the best way to make sure that the client's wishes are taken into account after their passing, uh, without a will, the payment may not go to who they want it to go to. Um, so in working with uh, these priority clients, uh, it's really important if the client tells you something about where they want their redress money to go, um, really important to keep really good file notes as well. Um, and so I'll pass you over now to Prue, uh, who has a short case study uh, on this topic. Thanks, so. Yes, we, we were working with a client who was very unwell. She phoned us with um, a, a, diagnosis of, a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. We did her application, got it lodged, which was great. Um, and she was very um, on board with the importance of having a will. She um, had a partner and she was concerned that the partner, if he were to receive the redress payment, 
would either gamble or drink the money away. She had uh, four of her own children and she had fostered three other children. So what she wanted to happen with the redress payment, which was going to be the only asset in her estate, was it be split eight ways. So uh, an one eighth to each of the, the husband or the partner and the, all of the children. We were able to arrange for a lawyer to visit her in hospital and to take instructions to do the will. He prepared the will. Unfortunately, the woman was not able to sign the will. She slipped into unconsciousness um, and did not come out. We had taken file notes as to what she wanted to do with the, the redress money, what her wishes were. There was no will and the legislation provides it, the, the scheme operator should look to the will or the intestacy provisions of that particular jurisdiction. The intestacy um, provisions in that jurisdiction would have meant that the partner received 50% and the children, the four children, would have received the other 50%. That is not what she wanted. And we were able to make submissions to the scheme with a copy of the unsigned will and a copy of our file notes to say, in fact, what she wanted was it to go, the payment to go eight ways. Um, and that's what happened. The scheme took that on board and the payment was made to the partner, the four children and the three foster children. So that was a really good outcome, again, of us working well with the scheme and taking really good bar notes. Back to you, Soph. Thanks. Okay, so uh, Maura, sorry, next slide, please. Yep, client capacity. So working with um, this ageing cohort of clients, we might have some concerns um, about whether the client has got capacity to go through and to engage and understand the redress process. So um, redress is a really um, an important legal decision and has legal consequences. Um, if a person accepts an offer of redress, they can't bring any further legal action against the institution. So it's an important, um, it's really important that the person understands the process and those consequences. Um, the things that we look out for um, as red flags are, um, for example, clients with early onset dementia um, and clients with physical conditions that might impact upon their decision-making capacity. Uh, for example, people who are um, undergoing chemotherapy or other treatment um, like that. So these are the basic tests that we apply as lawyers to determine if someone has capacity. Um, Basically, we're looking at does your client understand what the options are? Um, for example, they may have spoken to a normal lawyer to get advice about their legal options, their various legal options. Um, and so we need to ask, are they able to repeat that advice back to you? Um, can they tell you clearly what their options are? Uh, can they make an informed decision? Can they tell you clearly why they've made that particular choice? Uh, so what we really want them to be able to say after receiving our advice about their various options, um, if they are wanting to go through the redress scheme, we want them to be able to say something like, um, I want to be able to, I want to do redress because I think the civil claim process uh, will be far too hard for me emotionally, or, you know, I don't have time to do a civil claim because of my age or my health. Um, so we try to work with um, our clients to identify the best way to interact with them, for example, by working around the person's chemotherapy schedule uh, so that we can identify the best days to speak with them when they're in their best health. Um, we, and in working with a client um, in this category, we have to keep in mind that the client's capacity uh, may change over the course of our assisting them, uh, particularly when they have early onset dementia or other serious health concerns. So um, it's important that we're continually reassessing the client's capacity um, and potentially that depending on their condition that we start the conversation early about the option of substituted decision making for the future. Um, and, you know, they may need to put um, and enduring power of attorney in place now uh, for the future, depending on their condition. Thanks, Maura. Okay, so back to me to talk about the application process itself and some of the emerging issues that we're seeing. There has been a fair amount of media, um, especially around the leading up to the 30th of June, 
because the legislation itself had provided that the institutions had two years from the start of the scheme to join the scheme, to be a participating institution. Worryingly, as we got closer to the 30th of June, there were a number of key institutions that had not joined. There was a bit of um, blustering around and a change was made to the legislation so that the institutions then had until the 30th of June to indicate their intention to join the scheme. Um, once they indicated that, they have six months until the 31st of December 2020 to actually on board, which is what the, the jargon is within the department. Um, 156 institutions indicated that they would um, be doing that. And I think that figure has now gone up to just over 200. So these institutions have until the 31st of December to join. We are, have all seen the four institutions that have been named and shamed. Bearbridge, Blake's Entrance, Pony Club, Jehovah's Witnesses and Kenja Communications. We're hopeful that Bearbridge, which um, has been amalgamated into the Prince's Trust based in the UK, will finally join the scheme. Bearbridge was a, had properties or farms in New South Wales and Western Australia where child migrants were placed and there was a fair degree of physical and sexual abuse occurring in both of those farms and it would be horrible if they were not able to make a claim because their institution was not in. The other worrying institution is Jehovah's Witnesses. They have constantly thumbed their nose, not only at the Royal Commission, but at the National Redress Scheme and at any attempt at civil litigation. Um, it is not looking at all hopeful that Jehovah's Witnesses will ever be a participating institution. The reason why the institutions must participate is that when a redress payment is awarded or offered, it will be paid by the Commonwealth. So once the person has returned it with the application or the offer, return the offer, within three to five days, the money will be in their nominated account. The Commonwealth then issues tax invoices in arrears to the institutions to pay the Commonwealth. So part of the onboarding process is to determine that the institutions have the financial capability to meet the anticipated claims coming their way. So as I say, it's very unlikely that Jehovah's Witnesses will be joining the scheme. Now, what we have as options for clients where the, their institution hasn't joined, if they're, if they're naming one institution and that institution has not joined, the application will be put on hold and that may be put on hold indefinitely or until the close of the scheme. If there are multiple institutions named in the application form, so the, the person's abuse history involved um, abuse in, for example, the Salvation Army and the local cricket club, you would be, um, we, we know the Salvation Army has joined the scheme, but more likely than not, the local cricket club won't be joining the scheme because they won't have the financial capability of joining the scheme. You have to then make a decision and we would encourage you to talk to the lawyers at no more as to whether to proceed with only half of your application. So if you've named both the Salvation Army and the local cricket club, you can say, yes, I want it to proceed. It will only proceed with that Salvation Army and not with the claim against the local cricket club. So you will be getting 50% of your assessment. The important decision you need to make here is that you can only make one application. So if the local cricket club in two years' time joins the scheme, you cannot then come back and make another application against the, the local cricket club. So there's a lot of strategic thinking um, that needs to go on when you uh, have to make a decision whether to proceed with the application, even though one of those institutions hasn't joined. Again, we'd strongly encourage you to get legal advice, to give us a call. The other concerning part right now is the relevant prior payments. If a person has received a prior payment from the institution, that prior payment will be deducted only if it can be regarded as a relevant prior payment. 
We are finding that um, stolen generations reparation scheme payments will not be a relevant prior payment where those payments have been made for loss of identity, loss of culture, removal from family and for other broad government policies or actions. However, in New South Wales, we have had a stolen generation class action run by Carolyn O'Day, where people have received um, in excess of $100,000. Unfortunately, the deeds refer to abuse, both physical and non-sexual abuse that have been all part of that settlement payment. Those payments, those settlement payments, are being seen as relevant prior payments and being deducted. In some cases, we have been able to successfully submit that only part of that settlement payment should be seen as a relevant prior payment. We, it's a bit all over the shop with that because some of the independent decision makers are saying yes and some are saying no and they're deducting the whole amount. So some of our submissions as to only a part of the settlement payment should be deducted for being successful and some are not. Where you do have what could be seen as a relevant prior payment, please make sure that you deduct from that relevant prior payment the legal fees that have been paid, any counselling fees, any um, payments that went to dental work. In other words, really forensically dig, dig down and find out what was included in that relevant prior payment before it's deducted. Sophia talked about um, the difficulties or the emerging issues of people who are in custody and people who may have serious criminal convictions. What we're finding is that more and more people in custody, and so custody means that you're in prison, you're in a youth training centre, a community correction centre, or you are on remand, they um, are wanting to apply for redress. You do need to fill in a separate form and it's called applying from jail. I would encourage you to lodge that with the application form. Um, and there are, you need to get over the exceptional circumstances to, to be let through to continue with the application. The exceptional circumstances will be if that person has ill health and we are viewing someone with early onset dementia as someone with ill health, especially if they have um, two to three years left of their prison term, and there is a high degree of probability that they won't be able to recall what happened on their release, or if they're going to be in custody at the conclusion of the scheme. If they make an application and it is not successful um, in terms of being allowed to proceed, it's not viewed as an application that's been unsuccessful and therefore you can't make it another application. It is viewed as an application put on hold and it will wait for your client to be released from prison for them to contact the scheme to reactivate the application. So it is really important that when you're talking to people in prison that you get all manner of contacts for them um, when, when they're released. So that you have their mum's contact number or their partner's contact number. Because if what we don't want is for those clients to lose their opportunity to make an application. For people who have um, been sentenced to a single term of five or years or more, so that's not an accumulation of their prison sentences, but one term of five years or more, they need to lodge their application and we would encourage you to lodge the serious criminal convictions form at the same time, simply because it's less traumatising to lodge the application, then get a, a response from the scheme saying, well, you have to now lodge this additional form. So we are, in the main, lodging both at the same time. We are really quite hopeful that the majority of people sentenced to a five or five years or more will be allowed to proceed. The scheme is looking to exclude anyone who might bring the scheme into disrepute or lessen public confidence in the scheme. What I do know is that there is a prisoner in one of the states who is in prison for life, um, had, has committed the most horrendous crimes against children, and I won't go into the detail, 
Um, but I would have no doubt that were it to be known that they had um, convicted such a horrendous crime and got and received uh, redress, that there would be an absolute outcry. I want to move quickly on because I'm aware that time is slipping away, as it invariably does, to the offers that have been that your client will receive. The first part is that your client will be phoned. It's really important that if you're a support person for your client, that you sit in on that call. As I think any of us who've had um, health scare or really bad news know that when you're sitting in the doctor's surgery and they tell you something, you don't hear at all. Um, so it's really important in this situation where your client is being told their, their details of the offer that you're there so that you can be that second set of ears. If they accept the offer, um, which obviously they can do, they can accept the three components that we've talked about. So the monetary payment, access to counselling, or um, and, and the direct personal response. And as I said before, please encourage them to tick all boxes. It is important that they get legal advice before they accept that offer because they are giving up significant civil litigation rights. You can ask for a review. Um, um, look, I should go back and say that offer sits for six months. So you've got a six month window to do something. You can ask for a review, but importantly, the review may increase, it may decrease, or it may stay the same. And you can't go back if it's, it's, if it's been decreased and say, well, I'll have the original offer. The um, offer that comes as a result of the review will be the offer that um, is now on the table. You can reject the offer. Um, and again, if you're going to do that, we would strongly encourage you to get legal advice. Coming back to that six month period, if you have lost your client, can you please immediately phone the scheme and hopefully you're all assistance nominees and ask for an extension. If the client does not accept the offer, um, it will be taken to have been withdrawn and the client cannot apply again. So moving further on to the financial implications, can I encourage everyone to go onto our website, to go to tick on the tab for services and financial counselling, and you will see the resources there. There's a really important manual there or guide, helping clients receiving a national redress scheme payment and some really good fact sheets. Um, I would, the guide is for you, the fact sheets you can give to your clients. They are really useful. And of the points here, the Commonwealth and state debts will not um, have access to the redress payment for repayment. Obviously, if the client wants to clear those debts, that's fine. But the, the Commonwealth and state government recovery processes will not come in and take the money to, re, to, um, to pay off their debts. It's really important for clients to open a separate and second um, fee-free bank account in their own name. And I'll talk about briefly elder abuse that we're exceeding. For Centrelink, it, while it's not the, the redress payment is not income, it is an asset, and you do need to notify Centrelink that you have received an exempt lump sum, and they're the words that you must use. Deeming, I'm sure most people are aware that deeming takes place, and Centrelink, for the money that's sitting in, to, in an account, will deem a certain interest rate as applicable, regardless of what's actually earned. In relation to public housing, the um, redress payment will be exempt from the assets test, and we're currently advocating that the same will apply to residential aged care um, as an asset, but it not be part of the assets test. In relation to elder abuse, unfortunately, we are seeing a lot of that happening. There are available protections. I talked about having a second account. That is really important. And also looking at any way that you can increase the financial literacy of your clients. Please go to the National Debt Helpline, the Seniors' Rights Service and the Older Persons Advocacy Network. We are really seeing indications of where a PIN number is shared, that the money is very rapidly going out of our clients' accounts. Um, we're going against all of the grain here and we're asking that clients open a non-internet banking-based account 
so that they only have access to it. Um, we are finding that spouses are using a lot of influence to buy what they wanted and totally negating the other spouse's um, rights to the money that they have received. Um, and so we're not only seeing elder abuse, but we're seeing domestic violence occur where um, the money is being taken. So it's really important that we do everything possible to support our clients. Now I'm going to hand over to Maura to finish off. Thanks, Maura. Thanks, Prue. So as we are two years on since the start of the scheme, we're now at a stage where the Department of Social Services is conducting an independent two-year review of the scheme. So the review is being led by an independent reviewer and her name is Ms. Robin Crook. Um, and it is open to anyone who has engaged with the scheme in some form. So that means it's inclusive of survivors, whether they've already applied, um, are in the process of applying or have, are considering applying but haven't yet. It's also open to people um, such as those of you who are supporting survivors in applying to the scheme. So you're able to make a submission um, and provide feedback. So that can be done by a, a written statement or a verbal submission by a telephone. Um, and as far as we're aware, there is also going to be an opportunity to participate in a feedback study. But um, as far as we're aware, that has not been made available yet via um, the website. So, but once that is available, that and making a written submission or a verbal submission um, will close um, on the 30th of September, 2020. So the end of September. Um, also good to know that No More has published resources um, about engaging with the feedback process for the second anniversary review. And, and these are all available on our website. So if you go to our website on the front page, scroll down, there is a section um, under latest activities. And if you click on that, they'll give you information um, about you know, how to provide feedback to this review. Um, we've included a submission guide as well, so that can assist you in this process. I'm just going to move on to how No More can support workers um, who have clients applying to the National Redress Scheme or who are engaging with clients who have experienced child sexual abuse. So there is a number of ways, There's, there are like two ways um, primarily that No More can help you with um, supporting someone who's assisting to the National Redress Scheme. So our lawyers can provide you, um, your clients with legal advice about their range of options um, and also advice about applying to the scheme itself. So you can refer your clients to know more um, in order to access um, this legal advice. We also have a redress support service team which is led by Prue and that means we can support um, support services who are engaging with clients who've experienced child sexual abuse and we can provide support and assistance and advice um, about applications, applying to the scheme and your legal options. We have a number of resources available online um, and just going back to resources, we also have resources for support services as well. So um, those are available via that link on our website and if you access the website you go through the tabs from memory, if you click on a tab that says for support services you can access this portal but it's important to know that you first will need to register um, and in terms of engaging with us if you're referring a client or if you're a support service who wants to contact us you can reach us by our 1800 number um, and that is also listed later in the slides but it's also listed on our website and if you do call from a support service you can let us know you're calling from a support service and you'll be connected to our redress support services team who can provide you with advice. So here is some contact details about our different offices. Um, so as you can see, we have four different offices. The 1800 number is at the top of that slide. So that's a free 1800 number that can be accessed um, by yourself as a support worker or by clients as well. And there is the link to our website, which you can access um, to see our resources, either for the second anniversary review, or we also have available through our resource um, resources portal for support services. We have fact sheets, we have a 
manual um, that goes through a application with, if you're applying to the National Redress Scheme. And also we have really great animations um, as well that provide information about the processes involved in applying to the scheme. Um, yeah, so there's just some more contact details, but that's pretty much all from me. I'll just move on to the questions now. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, Prue, we do have quite a few questions. I realise that we've only got a few minutes to go. I'll just remind people again, if you wanted to download the slides, there's a handout um, in the webinar and also the webinar is being recorded. So if you have to go and you'll miss the last Q&A bit, you can always go back and watch the recording. So Prue, um, or Sevilla or Maura, did you have any last things to say or do you want me to go jump straight into the questions? Jump straight into the questions, Natalie. And look, if they don't, if we don't have enough time, if you can send them through, and I'll respond to each of the questions. Definitely. Thanks. All right, but I'm sure everyone's going to be interested in the answers. So, it, as a general, I'll start general, if I can, around no more. You mentioned that you have a support service for um, workers, for community workers. Does no more also assist family members of victims of child sexual abuse? Look, it's a really difficult question. Um, we're unfortunately seeing a number of family members who are showing a high degree of interest in the monetary payment, and we suspect there may be some abuse going on. Um, what we're more than happy if the client is consenting to the family member being involved, absolutely. And if there's a legal power of attorney, yes. Um, but we, we're just being a little bit cautious about family members right now. Okay. Um, we've got a question now, and I guess this is a bit around relevant prior payments. What's the link between um, victim support payments? I know in New South Wales and other states and territories, there's a victim's compensation or victim support scheme. If somebody's already received a payment under one of those schemes, how does that affect eligibility or payment? Um, look, it's not going to impact eligibility, but it, it may well be a relevant prior payment and be deducted. The important thing that we will be looking for is to see whether that payment has anything to do with the institutional abuse. For example, sometimes a victim's comp payment can be for, for, for familial abuse that occurred before the client went into the institution. So it wouldn't, wouldn't be, it, it'll be a prior payment, but it's not a relevant prior payment. So we do. We need to look at each one um, on its merits. Okay. And just around payments, you've mentioned the average being around the eighty-two thousand. I think somebody's yep. asking. Um, I guess so. There's two questions around payments. What's the the minimum amount someone can get under None. the scheme? So there, there's no minimum. Yep. Yep. So it could be a very I small amount. There's well. no minimum because if there's a relevant prior payment, it could bring the payment down to nil. Mm. So, okay. say for example, someone was um, assessed at one hundred and fifty thousand, but had received two hundred thousand, then the monetary payment would be nil. Okay. And on Thank the you. other hand, if somebody goes through, um, this question is around how much. Um, I guess this is how much money do people get from civil matters or class action applications? Well, how long is a piece of string? Um, and look, the, the worrying thing that we're seeing um, are the legal costs being charged. So that um, where, where someone might be getting two, two or three hundred thousand dollars, they may, may well be paying out eighty or ninety thousand dollars in legal costs to get that. So it's really difficult, but we um, do strongly encourage clients to just think about that option and to uh, refer them to one of our panel lawyers, civil lawyers, to get advice as to what, what's the likely prospect of success and likely outcome. Okay, so coming back to that situation, if somebody's payment comes down to nil, are they still eligible for the counselling and the um, response? Yes, they are. Personal response. Yes. Yep. Yep. Great. Okay. Now, there's some questions around that ticking the boxes, those three boxes. So, if yep. somebody ticks counselling but they're not ready to 
uh, access counselling, how long do they have to, to access the counselling before they lose that option? They have until the end of the scheme. There, there's, um, yeah, the, yeah, they do have until the end of the scheme. It's, and it's very, what we're seeing in quite a few of the states is that it's, it's going to be lifelong counselling. So you can dip in and out as your personal circumstances require. Great. And also on the application, um, somebody said that it's very common for a client to remember more details later on after they've submitted the application. So is there an option for providing more information at, at any stage of the application? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, what we're doing as part of the Redress Support Project is reviewing applications and very often we, we are realising that more information is needed where you see that's happened or a client comes in and says, look, I forgot to tell you X and Y, immediately put, phone the redress scheme and put their application on hold so that you can put together the additional information and send it into the scheme and lift the holding of that application. Okay, correct. Um, there's a few more questions. They're really good, aren't they? Um, they are, excellent. Yes. So, um, I think, Sophia, you mentioned that you had a client who had the application decided within three months. What's the average time frame, I guess, from lodgement um, of the application to an outcome? What, what, what are you seeing generally? Look, we're generally seeing six to 12 months, but that's on the basis that the institution has joined. Um, where we've got delays is where one of the institutions named in the application hasn't yet joined the scheme. Okay, thanks. Um, there's been, I can add there's been a considerable um, increase in the number of independent decision makers. So for quite a while there were only four and now it's in excess of 60. So there, what that means though that we are seeing often inconsistent decisions as I've talked about with the solar generations. Um, but we do, are beginning to see the um, offers coming through now at a much, rapid, much more rapid rate. Great. And one other clarification around the counselling, you said that's for, for someone's life. Do they need to have started the counselling before the end of the scheme or used up the counselling before the end of the scheme? Can you just clarify that? Um, that that's a very good question. Um, my understanding, especially in New South Wales, will be that once the person has um, been connected up with a counsellor, that will just continue uh, beyond the scheme. Because what the, the counselling is actually being funded by the states. So um, the counselling is either a monetary payment where the states are not providing counselling, so it's Western Australia and South Australia, um, but New South Wales and Queensland and Victoria are, are providing in-person counselling. And certainly New South Wales and I think Queensland have said it will continue. In New South Wales that's through victim services? But, yeah, through victim services, yeah. Great, okay. I think that's the end of the questions and I think we're just a bit over 11. So unless anyone's got any questions, I'm just gonna make another quick announcement is that we recorded a webinar and also a podcast with Prue uh, with, from No More back uh, two years ago or, or about 18 months ago when the scheme was starting. So you might've heard Prue mention words like assistance nominee, that kind of thing. So we go into some of the basics in those webinars. So I'll put a link to the recorded webinars and podcasts in the email that you'll get. If you want to go back and listen to those, it might have some additional information for you. Thanks Natalie, thank you. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Prue, Maura and, and Sophia. That was really interesting. I know that I learned a lot as well. And it was lovely having you join us today. And to everyone, thank you very much. We'll say goodbye. Thanks, thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.